Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do my Friday Reads video where I talk about the week in reading and any big bookish things that have been going on in the world. This has ostensibly been a much quieter week in the book world because we are between the Pulitzer Prize announcement of last week and the coming International Booker Prize announcement next week. I believe they will be announcing the winner on Thursday, the 26th. I could be wrong about that, but I believe that that will be the day that we will find out who the winner is. I am not going to do a prediction, but I would love to hear what you think will win. If you have a thought about it, please let me know in the comment section down below. I really think it was a strong long list, and I think it's a strong short list. Although the book I was most interested in from the list uh, was Love in the Big City, which did not make the short list. I think I'm rooting for Tomb of Sand. Even though I'm not going to do a prediction, I think that's probably the one that I'm going to be rooting for. But let me know what you think. So one thing I did want to revisit from last week's Friday Reads, which was a little bit more of a book rant <laughs> than it was a Friday Reads video. The Friday Reads was kind of uh, contained at the end, and a lot of it took the form of a conversation about book awards and diversity. Most of the feedback on it was very kind. Thank you for that. But there was a little bit of pushback, and I wanted to quickly mention one thing really quickly because it did come up. It is not my intention at all to imply that the jurors for this year's Pulitzer Prize were being racist for not awarding the prize to Honoré Fanon Jeffers. That is not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say that the juries in recent years or in the past have been racist. And let, let's stick with recent years. I think once you go further back, you probably could make an argument about that, but that's a whole other conversation. And in pointing out that there are four books by Black authors that I would have given the prize to in the last decade alone, I'm not trying to say that you either have to award the prize to a Black author or you're racist. I don't believe that, and I don't think anything I said really implied that, but since <laughs> it did come up, I feel like I should just quickly mention that. What I'm trying to say is that when you can look at the arc of the prize and all of the winners, and you see a pattern, it merits discussion. The jury changes for the Pulitzer Prize and for most major literary prizes every year. So I don't think you can really make a consistent accusation of something like that. And I don't think most jurors go in with a bad faith idea of not awarding a black author. I do think when you look at the results of what all of these juries are doing over the years and the winners are still predominantly white and it's been 34 years since a black woman has won the prize, I think you can start having a discussion about why that is. And that's what I think is really important about that. And I don't have an answer. I don't have a solution. All I can think is that maybe we have a very narrow definition of what literature is, and maybe we should open that up. And maybe we shouldn't have different expectations for authors of different backgrounds. That's all. And another thing that I had pointed out on Twitter is that if you look at the six books by Black authors that have won the Pulitzer Prize, four out of the six of them are directly about slavery. I had said five originally when I posted this on Twitter, and someone pointed out that The Color Purple is not actually set during the Civil War, it's set after. It's funny, in my head I always think of it as a Civil War book, but that person was right. It is set after the Civil War. However, both The Color Purple and The Nickel Boys very heavily deal with the period after the Civil War. You could say there are Jim Crow laws, especially in the case of The Nickel Boys, and The Nickel Boys also deals with the Civil Rights period, and really heavily deals with the abuse and murder of young black men. So ultimately, five out of the six Pulitzer Prize winners for fiction that have been written by black authors deal with slavery or racism or like historical context of black life in this country. The only book that has won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction and dealt with contemporary black lives was Elbow Room by James Allen McPherson, which was a short story collection published in 19... It either published in 77 or won the prize in 77. I could have my year wrong, but it's somewhere in that zip code. I think one thing you can point to as you look at why this might be is that it seems we don't take contemporary stories about Black life seriously as literature. 
And that's a conversation that I think we should have. And I'm going to leave it at that <laughs> for this week. I've already talked a lot about all of those things. So we're going to leave it at that and move on. One other thing I want to add on the Pulitzer Prize announcement for this year before hopefully putting it to bed <laughs> for a while and maybe looking forward to next year's Pulitzer Prize or continuing to look back through Pulitzer Prize deep dives is that someone told me about a video about Palmares by Gail Jones, which was one of the finalists for this year. It's from a channel called Lou Reading Things, and I am going to link this video down below. It's an hour long. I think it's worth every minute of your time because I got a lot out of it. It is a review of Palmares, which is about slavery in Brazil, but the review is by someone who is Brazilian, understands Brazilian history, and talks about a lot of really problematic things that the book does and ways that it misinterprets Brazil's history with slavery and almost deliberately tries to assume that Brazilian slavery was the same as slavery in the United States. And I had put a hold on Palmares at my library and I got a notification yesterday that the hold was ready for me to pick up. And this review has me thinking about Palmares in such a different way that I'm not even sure I want to pick it up. I might just let it go. I'm sure it's a great book, but this review really has me thinking about what it does. Like Gil Jones didn't really do research into the history. She kind of just wanted to use Brazil as a place. And the review talks about a lot of ways in which that is problematic. I will let Lou reading things speak about it. But if you have read Palmares, either before or since the Pulitzer Prize announcement, I would really love your feedback on it. But I would also encourage everyone to check out Lou Reading Things' review. It was done last September, and it really is thorough. It's researched. It has a bibliography in the notes. I found it absolutely fascinating. And again, I think it is really well worth your time. And I think it adds a lot to discussion of that book, which I haven't read yet, so I can't really add to it. But I found everything that she had to say totally fascinating. And I think you would too. So check that out in the description box down below. Let's get to the actual Friday Weeds portion of this video because I have a lot to report. I had mentioned that I started Solo Dance by Lee Katomi and translated by Arthur Reiji Morris last week. Didn't spend a lot of time talking about it because I figured that I spent enough time on my book rant that I would just talk about it this week because I would finish it. Sure enough, I did finish it over the weekend and I didn't like the ending, but I liked the book that led up to it, if that makes sense. What I would say is Solo Dance is sort of a compulsively readable look at a woman who feels alienated from her life, largely because of her sexuality. And as someone who came of age at roughly the same time that the protagonist did, it feels nice to see my own experience of the world reflected in fiction. And what that is, is that I was born when homosexuality was something that was really hidden away and shamed and something that you didn't want. It was always portrayed in a very negative light. And then as I got older, things started to change. But because I grew up in the before time, it's really hard to let go of all of the baggage. So I have all the baggage from the before time, but I was still young enough to take advantage of the post-Ellen, post-Will and Grace world. But it still feels like being born on the margin and Lee Katomi does a really great job emphasizing the sense of loneliness and despair that you can feel as part of a community that is not widely approved of or recognized even as progress is being made and how difficult it can be to leave those initial perceptions of who you are behind. The protagonist really feels recognizable and even at the depths of her depression, she feels like a genuine person that's no small feat at all. And since this is a really slim book, I'd say it moves really quickly, but without forsaking story. It does pack a punch in a small page count. I would also say, though, if sexual assault is a trigger for you, it will be a difficult journey. If suicide is a trigger for you, it will also be a very difficult book to read because it very heavily deals with suicidal thoughts of the protagonist of the book. 
But if you can get past those things, it will be well worth your time for the depiction of this character and how she tries to heal herself over time. But then there's that ending. I thought it felt a little bit gimmicky. And not to give anything away, but there's this do ex machina that just didn't really work for me. I am glad I read the book and I look forward to reading more from Likotomi in the future, but that ending just kind of, ah. But I did like the book leading up to it, so I would still recommend it, just with the understanding that, like me, you might be a little disappointed in where it goes, ultimately. But that's not all. I finished two other books in the course of this past week. I finished three books. In a week, I'm feeling really good about myself, especially since all of those were either physical books or e-galleys of a book. I had access to a galley of Solo Dance by Lee Katomi. Let me see if I can quickly get you a date when that will be published. Solo Dance by Lee Katomi, translated by Arthur Reggie Morris, is translated to be published on May 24th. So not that far in the future, but there you go. So after that, I had been planning to read The E-Galley of Tracy Flick Can't Win, which I had access to. And that one is going to be published in June. The exact date is June 7th. And I had been thinking to myself, I should probably reread Election before I dive into Tracy Flick Can't Win. And then I kind of thought to myself, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read the book. So I read the first chapter of Tracy Flick Can't Win. And immediately I thought to myself... I want to revisit election. So I did that. I picked it up. I had been kind of intending that maybe I would just kind of skim through it, not do a solid reread of it. But that's what ended up happening because this is a, sh a short book. It's 200 pages. Yeah, 200 pages exactly. And it does read very quickly. A lot of the chapters are very short. It is told in multiple perspectives. So even within a chapter, like here you have the beginning of chapter five, which opens with the perspective of Paul Warren, who is one of the characters. And by the next page, you've switched to a different character. She talks for, wow, she talks for five pages and then it goes back to Paul. And that's a long segment for one character to be talking. There are lots of little bursts of different people talking in this book. You're probably familiar with this because of the movie. I've read almost every book that Tom Perota has written, and I'm not necessarily proud of that, but I have. I think there's a book that I haven't read. Joe College, I think is even what it's called. I think that's the only one of his books that I have not read. I've gotten all of the others. So I'm going to do a video where I talk really specifically about both Election and Tracy Flick Can't Win. I just wrote a review and published it on my blog. I'll link that down below. And I'm going to do a video based on that review because I really talk, spend a lot of time talking about both of these properties and whether or not Tracy Flick Can't Win was necessary. We'll get into that. So I ended up kind of tearing through this. And this book mostly holds up, except when it really doesn't. And this is also a really interesting book because this is an instance where it feels like the movie adaptation has really usurped all of the conversation about the property. I think Gone with the Wind is an example of this, although I think people probably turn to the book Gone with the Wind more than they turn to the book of Election. It feels like when people refer to Tracy Flick, they're not talking about the book's Tracy Flick. It feels like they're talking about Reese Witherspoon as Tracy Flick, which is from the 1999 movie, released a year after the book. I was just talking to Joel last night, and I started saying, I haven't seen that movie in a very, very long time. And then I started thinking, have I actually ever seen that movie, or have I just seen clips of it ad nauseum for the last... 20 odd years <laughs> and I honestly don't know the answer and I don't plan on re-watching the movie anytime soon so I won't have an answer but it does feel like perception of the book is colored by the movie and one thing that really surprised me going back to the book is that there's really not a lot to the book it doesn't actually have any sort of conviction about the scenario it feels like the movie which I may or may not have even seen is more pointed and sharply satirical, and that's what people think of. But then you go back to the book, and it's 
hollow enough that you can graft your own feelings about the situation that Tom Parada presents onto it, even though he's not necessarily doing any of the work to get you there. He's just presenting the situation for you to respond to. I hope that makes sense. And the part that ages the worst is the part about Tracy Flick having an affair with one of her teachers. That happens before the book takes place. The book opens with the beginning of a student council election. The book was published in 1998, but it's set in 1992, so it will run parallel to the presidential election, just in case you might miss the metaphor that this small high school election is a stand-in for larger politics and all of the dirty things that go on in it. That had to be that parallel. But anyway, before the book takes place, Tracy has had an affair with her English teacher, and the book really doesn't want that to be a big deal. But it feels like it should be a big deal. And some of the ways in which Tom Parada tries to shut down the conversation of it really don't age well and feel gross. And the way in which Tracy and other girls in the book are really sexualized by the male characters feels gross. And to be fair, Tom Parada is not necessarily agreeing with you that it's gross, but he definitely kind of knows that it's gross, but he's not condemning it. I hope that makes sense. That's where the vagueness reminds Like, he seems to know this is a kind of gross thing, but he's not going so far as to agree with you or condemn the guys for doing it. And it almost pushes it back onto Tracy for taking agency of herself that she had this affair. And it's interesting because the most problematic thing about the book is Tracy's relationship with the teacher. And the reason that's interesting is that that is the exact thing that sets you into Tracy Flick can't win because Tracy Flick can't win is publishing in 2022, but it's set in 2018. So it will sort of parallel the me too movement. And it opens with Tracy reading news articles about people who have been accused as part of the me too movement and reflecting that her own story doesn't actually fit in with any of those. It, it's, it's not actually what happened to her, but then kind of wondering if the things that happened to her in high school actually had a really profound effect on her life that she just hasn't really been able to track because it has been so profound. And then Tom Perota kind of forgets about that and moves on. Ultimately, I think the flaw with Tracy Flick can't win is the same flaw that Election has, but Election gets away with it better. And maybe that's to do with the movie, because I think, again, the movie is more pointed and sharply satirical, and then you can go back to the book and graft all of that onto what Tom Perotta has put here. And just the situation seems to lend itself to something a little bit more urgent. There isn't really anything urgent about Tracy Flick can't win. And it doesn't feel like it justifies itself, which is an interesting conversation because you don't ask a standalone book like, well, does this book justify its own existence? But, and I am guilty of this, when a sequel comes out, it feels like it should justify its reason for being there. And I don't think we get there with this book. I mean, honestly, just the fact that Tracy Flick is in the title seems to point to the fact that they are really banking on this name recognition to get you interested in the book. And I don't think it earns enough of that. I don't think it really has enough of a point of view or anything to say about Tracy's life. And it doesn't feel like where her life is makes sense given the Tracy we meet in the book. And over the course of the book, it does tease out some of the reasons she ends up as an assistant principal at a high school in New Jersey. But once you pick at them, they fall apart. It doesn't really make sense. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that the plot of Tracy Flick Can't Win is sort of parallel to the plot of Election. In Tracy Flick Can't Win, she has been the assistant principal at a high school in New Jersey for several years and has been applying for principal jobs, but they haven't really come through. But now the principal at her high school is retiring and she's right there in the school so she knows the school, she, they know she can do the job, and she is the most qualified person for the job. So she's in the running, but just like an election where she's running for student council president, and although she's the most qualified person for the job, people keep 
People don't like her because of her ambition. They don't like her because she's qualified. So they end up looking for other people. And that's the same thing that happens in this book. And it feels like Tom Parada just contorts the plot or the arc of Tracy's life to get her back into a high school in order to make the setting so parallel in both books. I'll have a lot more to say in my individual video about it, but I think you could really honestly have just pointed back to election. I think there are a lot of comparisons between Tracy Flick and Hillary Clinton that Tom Parada seems to be inviting you to make, but he doesn't really do anything with that. And again, I'll be talking a lot more about that in an individual video about both of these books, which I am hoping to film today, but the day's getting away from me, so it's probably going to be next week at this point. So bear with me about that. At the end of the day, though, I did finish three books, and I feel really good about that. I have kind of put both of the LGBTQ and translation books to the side. I was kind of close to finishing Before Night Falls, but didn't quite. And I started the audio of Disoriental, but didn't revisit it this week. So I am going to try to decide what to do with these this week, because I'm trying to get through some of my e-galleys, because there are a couple of them that are releasing in June. And I have another audio that I might want to get to, but I'm hoping to finish these before the end of the month. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> the other big book update for this week is that I had mentioned last week that I started the audio of Remarkably Bright Creatures by Shelby Van Pelt. This is a new book. And I DNF'd it. I couldn't really do it because the book is sort of marketed as a story about um, an older woman who cleans an aquarium, who kind of forges an unexpected bond with an octopus. And the octopus and her are supposed to share the narration. And there's actually another character who takes up a lot of the narrative of this book. And I can't stand that character. His name is Cameron. He is this 30 year old white guy who feels really entitled and can't get his life together. And is just a mess, just a mess. And I'm sure by the end of the book, he's going to have learned life lessons and everything will be changed. I don't feel like I need to get to the end. It's exactly the type of story that I just kind of aggressively don't respond to in fiction right now. I've, heard a bunch of people especially on instagram talk about this book and they have loved it i do believe it's something that a lot of other people would enjoy but that storyline with cameron was just crushing my soul so i couldn't do it so I, I i dnf'd and i don't have any intention to get back to it i took a bit of a break from audio in order to focus on getting some of those books done and I just yesterday started a new release on audio because it happens to be on Scribd. It is called Ma and Me by Butsada Rang. And it is fascinating so far. It's a memoir of her relationship with her mother and how she was supposed to be the embodiment of their sort of American dream as they came to the United States from Cambodia and she was supposed to be the perfect daughter and she's a lesbian. And it's about her mother's inability to recognize her authentic self and how that ultimately drove a wedge between them. So it ticks a lot of boxes for me, but it's also just so far a really fascinating story. I haven't made it a lot of the way through, so I will talk more about this book next week. But I'm really enjoying it so far. And it's something I really wanted to get in during the month of May. Because, first of all, it's a perfect setup to June, which is my Pride Month reading. But also, May is AAPI Heritage Month, and I wanted to try to get this in during that. So I will hopefully be done with this by the time I talk to you in my next Friday Reads video, and I will have a lot more to say about it. So that's everything for this week's Friday Reads video. That's certainly enough. I'd love to hear what you've been up to, what you've been watching, reading, loving. We finished the first season of Abbott Elementary. I thought that was a great show. I can't wait for season two. Let me know what you've been up to in the comment section down below. And as always, I really appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.